birthed a criminal trial of a former president until now. The people of the state of New York against Donald J. Trump, officially underway. This has never happened before. It's never been anything like it. I'm very proud to be here. It's the so-called hush money case involving Trump and Stormy Daniels and payments made just before the 2016 presidential election. Our legal experts break down what happened inside the courtroom today, and the Trump campaign will join us in minutes. Come on in. I'm Blake Berman. This is The Hill on News Nation. All right. Happy Monday. Here we are. Here we go. Joining us today, hanging out, Chris Steyerwald, host of The Hill Sunday, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute as well. Sherry Bustos is the former Democratic congresswoman from the state of Illinois. Scott Bolden, News Nation contributor and former D.C. Democratic Party chairman. And Denise Gitsum, former aide to George W. Bush, News Nation contributor as well. Hello to you all. Happy Hello. Monday. Nice well, to have you in. You. I wrote down some notes about what happened across the country today. We had uh, massive layoffs at one of the biggest companies in this country, Tesla. Uh, there were major venues that were shut down. We'll get to that in a second. Israel, we're trying to see how they're going to respond to Iran. None of that is, is the main story today <laughs> because, Chris, Donald Trump criminal trial begins. And my question to you is, is, is this essentially day one of the general election? Well, I'm sorry to say that we've been in day one of the general election <laughs> for four years. Okay. Uh, this is a, an endless Mobius strip of the same things being rehashed over and over again. But what does change is who the audience is. And okay. this is what's really significant here. Donald Trump's, the prosecutions of Donald Trump, the many prosecutions of Donald Trump, helped him win the Republican nomination, helped him win it fast, and helped him win it decisively mm -hmm. because Republicans rallied around him. Now, the audience that's coming in are people who say, the weather's warming up here in D.C., yep. and people say, well, it must be time. We're moving into the general election. So now a new audience is watching at the same time that this gets real. And I heard he fell asleep in there a little bit today. <laughs> Nodded off a little bit in there today. So he's going to have to... He's going to have to pump it up. Well, it wasn't televised, right? So no. why would he have to stay awake? <laughs> For his liberty. I, yeah, I mean, today was, I mean, I would have loved to have seen what happened in, the, in that courtroom today. But also, you know, only one in four Americans is even paying attention at this point. I mean, this is a whole bunch of nothing. Not only that. What's well, a whole case, bunch of nothing? I mean, just, it it's sounds a like former it's a president on trial. But to the American voters. If only one in four is paying attention, and 55% have said that this isn't going to have any impact on how they vote, the only people that this can move the needle with at all, and this could be significant, is independents. But to be, to be fair, like, this is nothing new under the sun, to quote King Solomon. We have seen and heard this over and over, and this case of the four is the most legally dubious of all. So, hold on, before we get in... Okay, all right, go on. <laughs> he's, he's facing 34 felony counts, right? It's going to be an eight-week trial. I think America is going to be paying attention because you're going to have wall-to-wall -wall media coverage. And this audience and this demeanor you're talking about is much broader. The, the, the polling says that if he gets convicted of one or many, that could change how people think of him and how people vote on him. But let's make no clear, this is a fraud case, right? And it's a simple fraud case to prove as a former prosecutor from that office. And America is going to be paying attention to this. And I got to tell you, the one thing to look for, last or not, is how long Donald Trump can maintain his demeanor, his decorum, if any. If he goes off in that courtroom in front of that jury, you may be looking at a mistrial or you may be looking at him watching it from a video monitor. This is serious right. business. This is not politics. This is criminal justice. Okay, that's not politics. Hey, Blake, not. can I throw out <laughs> one question, though, po yeah. politically? So typically, if you look back on past elections, they would always say that Labor Day was the kickoff. Right. Um, so I guess I'm throwing out a question to this group. Because this is a first in um, an American history 
to see a, a, a former president on trial, mm -hmm. um, do we not think that Labor Day will be the official when people are going to start Congress paying attention? Don't, don't we all yearn for the days when Labor Day was <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that a better, more but, but we talk time about this all the time. Um, Your average, everyday person, do you not think that that's when they're well, really th going th to be paying attention? Think about it this way. Imagine there's a conveyor belt coming along, and yeah. it's got all voters on it. Right now, the first ones down the conveyor belt are the hardcore partisans, R's and D's. They're sorted off first. Boom, boom, boom. We pluck them off first. But as you get closer to the election, it gets harder and harder yeah. to grade the goods to go through. So every day closer to the election brings in more persuadable voters. Denise alluded to these folks as independents, but here we're talking about a lot of Republicans, too, who are grossed out by Trump. So this is 6, 8, 10 percent of the electorate, and these are the people who decide late because they hate politics. And, but us. those are the people who are going to really matter with the outcome of exactly. the election. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So that, that's the political side of things. <laughs> Some of it. Uh, come on in, Jesse Weber and Sarah Azari. Jesse, uh, Law and Crime Network host, News Nation legal contributor as well. Sarah is a criminal trial attorney, News Nation legal analyst, and author of the book, Unprecedented, A Simple Guide to the Crimes of the Trump Campaign and Presidency. All right. Um, just a, just a, wh where things stand on day one. Jesse, what went well for Trump inside yeah. that courtroom today and what didn't, as you see it? Well, first, let me, I think it highlights when you had 96 potential jurors, 50 of them excused, a lot of them because they couldn't be impartial in this case. Let me just call them out and highlight, we have to give them kudos for doing that. That's the kind of jurors you want who say, I can't sit on that jury. It highlights how difficult it is going to be to get an impartial jury in this case. And remember, Blake, if we end yep. up in a scenario where we can't find an impartial jury, we can't get enough jurors, then Donald Trump would be within his rights to renew a motion to change venue, which would move this into a different area and ultimately delay the trial. We're so, not there yet, but I think it's interesting to have that argument. And it's still premature, but I'd be curious to see if they can actually get fair and impartial so, jurors. So, Sarah, yeah, so to that point, Sarah, here's question 34. Do you have any strong opinions or firmly held beliefs about former President Donald Trump or the fact that he's a current candidate for president that would interfere with your ability to be fair and impartial? I mean, come on. How are you going to get <laughs> folks to answer no to that? You have to believe. Look, jurors are human beings. They come in with biases no matter who it is that's sitting at the defense uh, table. And what the issue is, here obviously this is the most polarized and polarizing uh, political figure in American history. Um, but you have to believe that we will end up with a uh, fair and impartial jury. Um, there's a lot of people to pick from. And I think the idea is that despite their politics, are they able to set everything aside and focus just on the evidence and uh, the testimony that they hear in the trial? I believe we'll get there. But what I thought was interesting, Blake, was um, some of the evidentiary rulings. You know, I, 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 we can look at it on the face and say it's good for Donald Trump, but nothing was really shocking or unexpected to me. I think the judge is, is being very cautious. Um, he's not allowing in prejudicial or remotely prejudicial evidence, such as Melania being uh, pregnant uh, during the Stormy Daniels affair, such as the Access Hollywood tape itself. Instead, he's allowing the email. So okay. obviously, it's not going to have the same impact on the jury, but, um, but it won't be prejudicial to Donald Trump. So I think this is going to be a fair trial so, overall. And, and if I could just highlight that, Sarah's 100 percent right. I mean, yeah. for all the criticism leveled toward Judge Mershon, he was very even handed today. He gave Trump a number of different mm. wins. Mm. And, and, you know, there was all this thing that the prosecution can't make this association between Michael Cohen's guilty plea to campaign vi finance violations because he's concerned the jury is going to say, well, if they, we let that in, they're going to automatically think Donald Trump was guilty of that. And that's a judge who you want. Yeah. So I think that's almost a win for Donald Trump in a way today. So so we're, we're going to speak to the Wait, Trump, to, we're to speak to the Trump campaign point. here more. more. Yeah, no, yeah, Sarah, I, I want to get your thoughts on this real quick, though, because we're going to speak to the Trump campaign momentarily. And it, it seems as if the one thing that, se that, that irked the former president today was this, uh, was the judge saying, you have to be here every single day for this criminal trial. And, and after the president mm -hmm. got out of the courtroom, he said the following, and I'll get your reaction on the other side. I can't go to my son's graduation, or that I can't go to the United States Supreme Court, that I'm not in Georgia or Florida or North Carolina campaigning like I should be. He says he can't do something personal, which is go to his son's high school graduation. He can't do something on the legal front, which is uh, appear before the United States Supreme Court. And he can't do anything on the campaigning front. Not anything, but a lot on the campaigning front, uh, because he has to be there in court. Is that... I, I got to run, but but to both of you real quick, and Jesse, I'll start with you. Is that the right ruling? 
I don't think it's really unique to Donald Trump. He's a criminal defendant, and under New York law, he has to be there. Now, I'm sure there'll be exceptions down the line. This is going to be a long trial, but nothing outside the realm of what I've seen. Okay. Sarah? Yeah. And I, 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 agree, with, I agree with Jesse, but I will say what didn't go well for Donald Trump was that ruling that his uh, lawyers are not going to get to say, hey, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you're going to hear from President Trump, and he might tell you X, Y, and Z, unless he actually takes the stand and mm. testifies. So this is interesting because he's boxed into making that decision about whether or not he's going to take the okay. stand, whereas any other defendant, it would be a fluid decision to make. Jesse, Sarah, got to leave it there. Thank you both. We'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Good seeing you. Thanks. You too. Okay, so the trial expected to last somewhere in the area of six to eight weeks. The judge in the case today told Trump, as you heard there, that it'll have to be in attendance daily. That could impact how the Trump campaign plots out when and where the former president will head on the campaign trail. Joining us now is the Trump campaign national press secretary, Caroline Levitt. Caroline, thanks for being with us here on the Hill once again. Uh, appreciate the time. Nice to see you as always. So we saw the, the former president today in the 9 o'clock hour here on the East Coast walk into the courtroom or walk into the courthouse, make a statement to the media. Then there were court proceedings. And when this wrapped up in the 4 o'clock hour here on the East Coast, he walked out, spoke to the media again. Is, is that what we are going to see every single day uh, during this trial from the former president essentially campaigning by courtroom? You will continue to see the former president make statements in and out of the courtroom to expose the truth about this sham witch hunt. And as much as the Democrats want their entire strategy to confine President Trump to a courtroom for the next several <laughs> weeks to get Joe Biden over the finish line and increase Joe Biden's favorability in the polling, it is not going to work. The American people see this case for what it is, and that is election interference. District Attorney Alvin Bragg and this judge have had seven years to bring this case forward, but they aren't. Do they never did it. They are doing it now in the midst of this election cycle. President Trump remains defiant. Our campaign has never been stronger. We will continue to send the president out on the campaign trail to bring his winning message to voters across this country. That includes after court. Yep. That includes if court is off on Wednesdays. It includes weekends. And he will continue to use the power of his voice and social media to get the truth to the American people. How is this going to impact your scheduling, Caroline? Because every day that he's in a courtroom is seemingly at least a day. Maybe at night there could be exceptions, but as a day that he's, that he's not out on the trail. So I'm wondering if you could peel back the curtain here for a second. How is this going to impact your scheduling, and how does the campaign think about things? I just told you we will continue to, for President Trump will continue to be on the campaign trail as much as possible. Of course, it is an absolute shame, not just for the city of New York, but also for this country that the former president of the United States is being prosecuted in this way, again, by a Democrat district attorney in Alvin Bragg, by a judge who has a clear conflict of interest in this case and has donated money to Joe Biden. This is a witch hunt, and the American people see that. The president will continue to hit the campaign trail as much as he possibly can. He will continue to speak to the media, as you heard him do today, because he's unafraid to do so, okay. unlike Joe Biden, who is hiding in the White House. Caroline, I'm wondering real quick, um, does this change the timing of when he will announce his vice presidential selection? Will it speed it up? Because right now, President Biden is able to go out and campaign whenever he wants. The vice president, Kamala Harris, is out there campaigning yet again once more with him in a courtroom. I'm wondering, are you going to, is, is the former president going to push up when he announces his vice presidential pick so that they can go out there and do some campaigning on their own? Well, anytime Joe Biden goes out on the campaign trail, it appears that his favorability with the American public actually declines because he can hardly speak or walk. And so we encourage him to continue to get out there because it hurts him, because people see how feeble he is. The president will make a decision on his vice presidential pick when he feels it's necessary. He will announce that to the American people when he decides, and he will make a great choice that will be far better than Kamala Harris. I can assure you of that. And I just want to say one more thing, Blake. We saw the president president walk into this dirty New York courtroom today while there are real violent criminals running free in this city right now being released back into the streets. And it shows how ridiculous and petty this case is because Joe Biden's weakness is creating chaos and war all over this world. We are on the brink of World War Three. Okay. Inflation is increasing. Our border is wide open. And this is what the Democrats are focused on. Caroline Levitt, Caroline Levitt uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, talk to you again soon. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Um, real quick, before I let Chris wrap this up, as you well, sit there, I'm arms folded. <laughs> what, what do you? What, 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 I, I wonder from the two Democrats here, what did what did you hit? The, what did you hear there, Scott? Real quick. In the uh, I, I I heard political talking points. I heard half truths and misleading statements, but it's a political piece. But again, this is the criminal justice system, and Donald Trump drives this entire neg ne negative narrative based on his behavior and what he directed his people to do. We'll find out whether the government can prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt or not, and America will be watching and listening, and they'll make a decision on voting okay. after these trials. Sherry, what'd you hear there? Um, wanting to scare the American public, talking about being on the verge of World War yeah. III. I, I mean, she's on. She's got her talking points down. Um, but look, I mean, if I were President Trump, I, by, former President Trump, I would use the um, opportunity before and after going to, to court um, to, to my advantage as well. Um, so, you know, he's doing what he should be doing. You know, the one th we haven't talked about Joe Biden yet. Uh, today, he, held, he, he met with two world leaders, Chris, in the White House, mm -hmm. played the role of president of the United States, mm -hmm. commander in chief. And I wonder if that's going to be his strategy is whenever there are big moments inside a courtroom, if he says, you know what? I got this thing, I'm the president, I, you know, and, and try to play that role. Well, this week the president's going to Pennsylvania, uh, where they're going to, both of those men are going to spend an extraordinary amount of time, uh, because it's the number one swing state, it is the big kahuna. But to the point about Donald Trump being on the campaign trail, mm -hmm. <laughs> how much was Donald Trump on the campaign trail before this trial? That's right. Not much. Not very much. Mm -hmm. Primary, though. Yeah, well, pr but, but pr even in the primary, even whatever... Trump does not do the kinds of rallies and the kind of campaigning even that he once did in 2016. He doesn't need to because he is a television figure. Donald Trump became president because he's a television star. This is a television That's show, right. and he's going to use it yeah. for okay. its attention. Mm -hmm. All right, by the way, as the first day of Trump's criminal trial continues to close, shares of the media company bearing Trump's name sold off today. Trump Media and Technology Group, which operates under the ticker symbol DJT, filed paperwork that would allow for the sale of millions of shares, including Trump's stake. Trump Media and Technology Group Corp's stock closed down more than 18% today. The company still valued, though, north of $3 billion. Meantime, still come here from the Hill on News Nation. An unprecedented air raid in the Middle East. Iran attacks Israel with drones and missiles. And now Israel is reportedly set to respond. Plus, is there a catch-22 along the southern border? How one congressman is saying federal aid is actually turning one city into a quote-unquote magnet. I'll talk with Congressman Henry Cuellar about his message and what he's hearing from the White House. Plus, on the other side of the break, you are breaking down what, my friend? Would you like to have some good news for a change? I do. Would you like to have yeah. some good news? Uh, this, American cities are getting less violent. Murder <laughs> rates are down. We're going to talk about why. We're going to talk about how. And we're going to take a deep dive in the data. That is good news. By the way, uh, speaking of good news, would you look at this? 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue right now. We hit 80-something degrees here in Washington today. Spring has sprung. You're watching The Hill on News Nation. Ooh. All right, welcome back to The Hill. Across the country, violent crime is dropping in many major American cities. The Wall Street Journal, for example, reports that this is a reversal from pandemic era highs, with the U.S. potentially on pace for a reduction we haven't seen in a decade. So what's happening and how is it being felt all across the country? Steyerwald is here to break it all down. Chris? So you know how Joe Biden likes to say he created 15 million jobs or he's mm -hmm. going to create 15 million jobs. You know, the best way to create 15 million jobs is to destroy 20 million jobs in one month, <laughs> uh, which is what happened in the American economy in 2020. So... We should remember as we talk about these things that these great improvements are a result of astonishing spikes in the crime rate in the United States that took place in 2020 and 2021. But here's your first magical statistic. 2024 versus 2020, 20% drop in murders in 100, uh, spread out across 133 cities. Uh, this is looking just at the first quarter of this year uh, compared to last year. And look at some of the cities where you see Columbus, Ohio, San Antonio, Texas, Las Vegas, Nevada, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Huge decreases. So th there's the number of murders on one side and the percentage decrease from the year before. These are substantial declines. Now, in the spirit of full disclosure, it doesn't work everywhere. In some places, 
they got problems, right? Louisville is particularly bad. Uh, St. Louis and Atlanta continue to be bad. Uh, and Albuquerque uh, on the list, too. But nationally, it's good. Nationally, the crime, the, the, the crime story is good nationally. And here's what I want you to think about. So we took these numbers, and it wasn't just on murders. It was on all sorts of crime, but it was also on overdose deaths, it was on traffic fatalities, it was on negative interactions on airplanes, people being detained on airplanes. During the pandemic, we kind of lost our minds, right? Uh, things got very, very crazy in these United States. Uh, we also know that part of the story is that after the police brutality protests of 2020, police departments in a lot of parts of the country stepped back uh, and uh, criminals took the opportunity. But my point to you and my encouragement to you is that we should take the win, right? Uh, this is good, and we should give ourselves a little bit of credit here because two years in the history of a giant continent-spanning 333 million-person country is not very long. So we are getting over it with uh, many of these bad things that we had during the pandemic, and we can be grateful for that. Yes, we can. Steyerwalt breaks it down. Um, it's interesting that you related it to the economy off the top, because I say all the time, like, with all these economic numbers, during the pandemic, you can't... Compared to what? You, you yeah. Compared to what, right? Like, it was it was awful. We And and so, you know, with these numbers, you're saying at least just take the win, because, may, you know, obviously things were skewed during the pandemic, but... So what it looks like, and, and I look today at a host of trends, and it looks like we're going back. We had, pro we had big problems prior to the pandemic, but we saw all of those problems right. intensify, and people just sort of went crazy. And we are getting back to a, a much better place on a lot of these questions, and that's okay. That's good right. for for us to say, and it's okay to not say that, the, that everything is a catastrophe. But it, it does feel like the economy because you see the numbers, but you don't feel the impact. And I think that's what people are experiencing is the reality of where the two places that I live, which sadly did not make that cut of improving, <laughs> D.C. and San Francisco. Hmm. Are, I mean, all you hear is about the crime. So while we may not be murdered violently, guess what? We can't receive Amazon packages because they're stolen. Our cars can't be parked because they're broken into. And guess what? Here in D.C., our own Congressman Claire, who we're going to have up next, actually had his car jacked as does Naomi Biden. D.C. Well, finally had some improvement. D.C. Mm -hmm. was a lag, the improvement in the rest of the country. Right. But uh, but this year, D.C. is finally having some improvement. And another problem here is disorder. Hmm. So yeah. when we uh, we saw there, there is, if, the, if we still have it, about how people feel about crime. Uh, that it's a very serious problem, these Gallup numbers. Um, people do feel that it, crime is a serious problem, and it's because of the disorder. All you have to do is walk from here to Union Station, yes. mm -hmm. and you see uh, transients, and you see people who are unwell, and you see a lot of urban chaos around you, and it leads to the feeling of unsafe. Perfect. Real, real quick, Chris, uh, the, the only exception I would take to your reporting is the idea that anecdotally the police stepped back after George Floyd. I don't know whether there's a measure for that or not, but George Floyd should have made the police more vigilant in doing their jobs better and more appropriately. I read the report, um, and that, that that's a bit disturbing because I hope the police in Men in Blue uh, didn't do that. In, in the District of Columbia, we are sorting out some very interesting <laughs> politics right now <laughs> around yeah. this very issue. All right, so the, much more ahead here from the hill they are back at it again pro-palestinian demonstrators causing passengers all sorts of nightmares uh, in chicago california oh. the golden gate bridge shut down for hours is this really the right way to protest did you see what happened at the airport in chicago today my goodness and what do you see here in this tweet Nike facing Olympic-sized <laughs> backlash after revealing track and field outfits for the Olympians coming up later this summer. The company's response, the panel's reaction when The Hill returns. Oh, man. Well, now it's Israel's move. The country's war cabinet met throughout the day today as its government debates how to respond to, or, to Iran's weekend drone spree, with Israel's military chief saying today that his country will respond. President Biden told the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that the U.S. would not participate in any counterattacks and made brief remarks to reporters today. The United States is committed to Israel's security. We're committed to a ceasefire that will bring the hostages home and preventing conflict from spreading beyond what it already has. 
All right, so President Biden, earlier today, Sherry, what do you think we're going to hear out of the president next? And what do you, what do you want to hear out of the president Well, next? I don't think he's going to call for a unilateral ceasefire, which is what all these protesters are asking for, nor do I think he should. But the, the criticism, I know Senator uh, Fetterman was critical of the president yeah. today. I think it's unfair. You think I, this is unfair? Here, here's what Fetterman said. Uh, he said, quote, it's astonishing that we are not standing firmly with Israel. And there should be never any kinds of conditions and all that. When a nation can launch hundreds of, dr of drones toward Israel, I'm not going to be talking about conditions, meaning aid, ever. How, how's that unfair? And why should we hear it's, more it's Democrats It's unfair to President Biden. That? It's unfair to President Biden. We were there. We helped shoot down these drones. Um, he, has, he has been a friend of Israel. He has spoken out in favor of Israel to the point where there are these protesters all over America who are critical of Biden for being too pro-Israel. So I, but, I, but I don't think, um, I, I think it's unfair of what Fetterman said about President Biden. Is that unfair or do we want to hear more Democrats along the lines? I mean, I, I really respect your career and I think that I'm glad that you're Ooh, that's, saying that's that we should that's setting you up for... No, 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 I'm... I'm <laughs> uh, no, 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 I really, I really... No, you've always been fair and this is a really... I'm so glad that you're saying what needs to be said, which is as a Democrat, and I thought this was true in the Democratic Party for so long, um, but, you know, your party's really moving away from you on this issue. And if somebody as progressive as Fetterman can come out and say the truth, which is like, you don't get to make one statement and then do a bunch of other things that silently kind of backhandedly undermine your allies. I mean, these are this is a real politic issue. Put aside the, the domestic issues of the day and how badly Biden needs to win and how quickly his base is leaving him in that 18 to 35 age range. And let's talk about the existential threat that China, Iran, and Russia as the new axis of evil pose to America and our greatest ally in the Middle East. This is something that we cannot have any daylight between our countries on. And this, I will always stand on this issue. This is such, there is no moral equivalence between what Hamas, Iran, and this axis of evil that we fight every single day have between us. There's no moral equivalence between them and who we and Israel are. Yeah, but I don't think... And there I, never will be. I don't think 18 to 35-year-olds are anti-Israel. I think you uh, can be... Uh, I think you on, need to double-check your facts. I don't have to double-check my facts. Yeah, you I'm do. I'm saying how this war has been implemented, America's role in it, and how Israel has implemented the war and the so images you, that they're seeing, mm -hmm. right? So, I don't think... I, I think that's a real issue. That 30 to 40 percent in the polling says that they don't support Biden on this issue. But let's look at Israel. Israel hasn't been perfect in implementing this Nobody war strategy. Nobody said that. There, there was reporting... The There's no there, more there was, and that. that's not the point. I am arguing that because that's part of the debate. That's there was reporting the over the weekend, uh, Politico. Some Biden advisors believe that the assault on Israel may temporarily grant them a reprieve from Democratic critics who have slammed the president for being overly supportive of Israel at the expense of Palestinian civilians. Friend of the show, Morgan Ortegas, responded by saying this. If an attack on our only Democratic ally in the Middle East helps you with your base, your party has a major problem. Amen. We don't have a major problem. The 30 to 40 percent of the younger people, one, they don't have a history that folks like my age do. But secondly, when they see the images, when you see the 30,000 that have been killed, when you see aid workers that have been killed, the... the Israel's taking responsibility for that, and the protest for that is simply with the implementation and how it's happened. Even the White House has been critical of that. You can't put, take that out of the debate. All right. It's got to be part of it. Uh, meantime, we also await the uh, president, what he might do with the southern border. After reporting last week that the president was considering limiting asylum claims at the border, Axios has a new report out today. Here's the headline, quote, Inside Biden's delay on going nuclear at the border. Now, the article reads, quote, President Biden's road to a dramatic executive order to stem illegal border crossings, now expected within weeks, has dragged out for months as he prepares for legal challenges, political backlash and enforcement shortages. Come on in. Uh, De uh, Texas Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar, if you watch this show, you know you see the congressman here frequently. We appreciate seeing you as always. So, uh, Congressman, one of the reasons we love talking to you, you shoot us straight. Uh, you're a Democrat who, is, uh, who represents a border town. What are you hearing about the president's potential executive orders and what do, what do you want to see him do? Well, you know, certainly I wish she would have done it yesterday, uh, but it's been dragging on for a while. But, you know, again, that's an eternal debate within the White House. But I, I feel that the president can do certain things as an executive order using Title Eight, which is the law, using expedited uh, removal, which is the law. And think about all the resources. We added billions of dollars to Homeland 
uh, where now they have resources. It's a matter of can we go ahead and uh, take some action at the border. But I do want to say this. The numbers have gone down. If you remember in December, it was 10, 12,000 a day. Right now, in between ports of entry, it's about 3,800. So the numbers have gone down. I think the president needs to look at this downward uh, movement that we see and do take more action so the numbers keep going down uh, as soon as possible. You know, I mentioned, Congressman, uh, we, we love to have you because you give it to us straightforward. It was fascinating to hear you say right off the top. Um, you would have wished that he had, had done it yesterday. So what do you think? I, I, is he afraid of moving forward, afraid of upsetting the Democratic base? Why, why hasn't he taken action as you see it? Well, you know, I, I don't want to speculate that, but I, I do know there is uh, internal debate. Uh, some folks, I think more of the career uh, officers at Homeland know what needs to be done. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't want to see catch and release. But then you got some other folks that uh, feel differently. So it's an internal debate. But I hope that he looks at the same polls that all of us have been looking at. And one of the biggest things out there, uh, out in the area, in the country, is border security. And he needs to understand that he needs to address this. Look. If he does some executive action, we know there's going to be a lawsuit. We know, of course, you know, some people feel that we're doing too much. Some people feel we're not doing enough. Uh, but in my personal opinion, I think he needs to look at some sort of executive action. Okay. Um, I, I saw you in the, in the news over the weekend, Congressman. Uh, quote, uh, Henry Cuellar warns that using federal aid to help migrant travel makes San Antonio a quote-unquote magnet. Can you explain, sir, what you mean by that and what's going on uh, in, in your area? Look, uh, in Laredo, which is 150 miles outside of San Antonio on the border, even our non-for-profits are telling us that San Antonio has become the milk, quote, the milk and honey place, where people know that if they get to San Antonio, they're going to be transported uh, to their place of location. I also understand what San Antonio is saying, that is, if they don't move them out, they're going to be sleeping in the streets of San Antonio. But when I created this program back in uh, uh, some years ago, I did not want to see money be used for transportation. Uh, in the old days, and I'm talking about 2013, 2014, people would uh, borrow phones and call their relatives and say, hey, can I have some money? Can you buy me a bus ticket and send me over here? But now they know that there is federal dollars that can be used to transport people. So this is not the way I had it. And it's interesting, FEMA at the very beginning had about a 10 percent uh, uh, cap on it. Now there is no cap. You can use whatever monies you want to for housing, hotels. You can use whatever money you want to for transportation dollars. Uh, again, with all due respect, this is not the way I envisioned right. this when I helped start okay. this program back some years ago. Congressman Cuellar, we'll leave it there. Uh, Henry Cuellar from the state of Texas. Thank you, Congressman. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much. Yep. So what's going on, Chris? Because we hear these stories. You hear a congressman like this who says, you know, I, I wish it would have gotten done yesterday. But yet the president hasn't moved. Well, we, we said a long time ago that before the election, Joe Biden would crack down at the border. He has no choice. There is no, there is no both in his duties as president and also in his duties as the leader of the Democratic right. Party, he is obliged to do this because the, the problems are real and the political liabilities are enormous. Here's the thing, though. If you do it and you screw it up, it's mm -hmm. worse than not doing it at all. Okay. And we've watched this administration struggle with execution on some things before. Right. And I'm going to guess that they've decided <laughs> we're going to hold, wait, do it, do it right, and do okay. it hard. All right. Uh, by the way, pro-Palestinian protesters causing chaos at thousands, uh, for thousands rather, today at major venues all across this country. Protesters blocked, for example, the highway leading to Chicago's O'Hare Airport this morning, which caused major traffic delays. Some travelers were forced, by the way, to, to walk along the highway with their suitcases just to get to their flights on time. Uh -huh. New York, the same thing happened across the city and even on the Brooklyn Bridge. Speaking of bridges, there's this one in San Francisco <laughs> that you might have heard about. Total standstill on the Golden Gate Bridge uh, as 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 the pro-Palestinian protesters blocked all the traffic there. All these protests were planned as part of a quote-unquote economic 
blockade around the table real quick. When you see this, what do you see? I see exactly why they call my home state the land of fruit and nuts. <laughs> and I also am, I feel like every one of those people needs to pay the economic ramifications of all the damage they've done in preventing people from getting to work, catching flights, all the disruption. There's, there has to be hell to pay for the things that they do in the name of democracy. First Amendment is expensive, yeah. difficult, and illegal, and troubling. You and don't get to do that. Well, they're they're normal, normal, could a normal person that? do that, Scott? I think, I think they'll be dismissed based on the first. First Amendment argument. Okay. Sherry, what did you say? It, wor- it worries <laughs> me. Oh, sorry. You want to get well, yeah. we're, 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 No, no, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm running short on time. Yeah. Yeah, it, it just worries me about what's ahead between yeah, now and the election. <laughs> it worries me uh, being an Illinois and what's going yeah. to happen. Oh, the, the DNC. Republic. It worries me a lot. That's what that's yeah. what my emotion is. Yeah, that's a, that's a, the exactly right point. The Democrats are going to convene in August for their national convention, and they're doing it in Chicago, and it's going to be a doozy. And this stuff is going to be hard, and I'm upset because I don't want to walk from the airport. I'm too fast to walk from the airport. <laughs> I remember they don't protest You're right, people no. from the airport. Okay. All right. Meantime, <laughs> coming up here on the Hill, it is one of the largest companies in the U.S., and now Tesla announces some pretty big layoffs. So what is going on there? We're back in a few here on the Hill. Stay with us. by many, many folds over, is feeling the pain too. Elon Musk announcing today that Tesla will be laying off 10% of its workforce all over the world in order to make the company, quote, lean, innovative, and hungry for the next growth phase cycle. Meantime, Nike is unveiling the uniforms for the 2024 Summer Olympics in Paris, but (laughs) the athletes that they are intended for... Not too happy. Oof. When this photo uh, of the outfit was revealed <laughs> online, a Ugh. swarm of negative comments appeared with many of the female athletes <laughs> criticizing the skimpy fits. U.S. national uh, champion distance runner Lauren Fleshman, for example, writing on Instagram, quote, I'm sorry, but show me one WNBA or NWSL team who would enthusiastically support this kit if the outfit uh, was truly beneficial to physical performance men would wear it. Um, (laughs) Nike unveiling these. By the way, I learned today that Sherry was a star athlete. (laughs) Yes. You're a star athlete in college. I did not know this about Sherry. What do you make of it? Nike's catching some grief. Um, I wouldn't want to wear it. (laughs) 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 I mean, maybe in my playing days. um, But, yeah, I wouldn't want to wear it. You know, I'm guessing they got some athlete input when they were designing these things, and if not, they probably should have. Yeah. Yeah. um, It looks like... A Bra- the Brazilian cut bikini Ooh, back, but one, turned around. It's the one on the like right. Like on the there. front, yeah. You know, the, if you guys want to spend like the best hour of your life today or 10 minutes, just scroll through the comments on this because I have to highlight one. This is a comment that made me dead. It was from an Olympic hurdler and sh- and who said, I think the European Wax Center should sponsor the team this summer. <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. I laughed so hard. Unsubscribe. You want to unsubscribe. Scott's, uh, yeah, Scott's, I know the Scott's, Scott's here, here was, here was Nike's uh, response to all this, by the way. They said, um, <laughs> they said, quote, beyond the two looks showcased in Paris, there are nearly 50 unique pieces across men's and women's track and field and a dozen competition styles fine-tuned for specific events. So that is how they are pushing back on it. All right, before we go, uh, did you see this? Saturday Night Live invoking News Nation over the weekend, setting a sketch in this weekend show during a fictional News Nation town hall, but focusing on some familiar faces back in the day, I guess, uh, in the audience. Watch. Welcome to News Nation. I'm Bobby Moore. In tonight's live stream town hall, we'll discuss the potential power and pitfalls of the coming AI revolution. You two really don't know that you look like Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> I, I've heard rumblings. <laughs> News Nation, Scott, oh on SNL. So loving it, loving it. You know, they, they, I don't think they were even making fun of News Nation. No, you got to no. plug and stuff. What's there to make fun of? But you, Nothing at all. <laughs> but, you, but you've made it basically on late night TV. When you're That's honest, pretty good. Yeah. Against the competition, too. They could have picked anybody. Yeah. I thought your, your point on this was spot on. What, that I love Beavis and Butthead? I do love <laughs> Beavis and Butthead. That's true. But it's also this. Um, I, I have no idea why uh, NBC picked us, uh, right. Saturday Night Live picked us. But one reason could be Hmm. that we are fulfilling our brand, which is if you want to talk about a news channel and demonstrate that it's news, but don't want to say that it's right or left, 
right. News Nation and our uh, efforts at aspirational fairness. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this speaks very well of that, that we are a safe place that you, that you can do that, and that's cool. You're here. Agree Bravo. with you. Bravo. Yep. By the way, primaries. Uh, continued over the weekend. Democrats in Alaska and Wyoming had their turns. Yes, this is still happening. <laughs> and that includes those in Government Hill, which is a neighborhood in Anchorage, Alaska. Anchorage votes Republican, with Donald Trump winning 2020 and 2016 in the presidential election there. Now, there's only one congressional district in Alaska, which is represented by a Democrat, though its two senators are Republican. A little from our hill to yours. Hello to those watching us on News Nation, listening to us on Sirius XM in the Government Hill neighborhood of Anchorage, Alaska. Leland Vitter joins us on the other side of the break. Stay with us. You're watching The Hill here on News Nation. It's the mystery that has gripped America. What happened to Riley Strain? Now his full family is speaking out for the first time, and they're ready to reveal what they think really happened. Banfield, tomorrow at 10, 9 central. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. Before we say goodbye, here's something that caught our eye, probably yours too. It's tax day. The billionaire, by the way, Mark Cuban, took to this, uh, social media to reveal that he'd be paying give or take $275 million to the IRS this tax season. He said he sent the wire today. It comes after an, an initial post in which Cuban took a dig at Donald Trump, saying, quote, I'm proud to pay my taxes every single year, tag a former president that you know doesn't. Leland Vitter, host of On Balance. What's good, my man? It's tax day? It is Can tax you do day. the show? Because I still... <laughs> you you got you to figure that and finalize that you stuff? You know, this is what I think is interesting about Mark Cuban, though. Is this is a that guy... That he's running for president yeah, at some point? Yeah, okay. And in 2017, <laughs> uh, he wanted to reduce the size of government by at least a third to make it more efficient. On Trump's 20, uh, 2005 tax return, said good for him. 2004, or 2024 now... It is Mark Cuban, uh, I am the patriotic billionaire who is right. happy to pay uh, my fair share. You know what's interesting? It's 200, yeah, go I don't know whether, yeah, this is a good point about whether that's really his fair share, because it was 288 million. Well, that's what I was going to say. Is 275 million for him a lot or a little? Like, I don't know. 